Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be ranting away at you at various things that I think are important, think you should know about, maybe do something about. Uh, as always, comments, questions, reactions, whatever, can be sent to me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. Or you can go to my website if you prefer, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can leave a comment there, or you can get the email address from there if you didn't catch it. Uh, as always, again, if you do send me email, please include something in the subject line like left side of the aisle or your cable show, something so that it's clearly not spam. And be a little patient. I'm actually very slow about answering email. I really am. Uh, but you will get an answer. Just may take a little while. All right, with that, let's get started. Uh, I always like to start where I can with good news. I've got a couple of bits of good news this week. The first actually is proof that activism and conservation, or to be more accurate, activism-driven conservation, can and does work. Several years ago, the, the slogan, Save the Whales, became almost a joke among the right wing. It was uh, used as a way of mocking all things radical, progressive, or even simply liberal as just merely like foolish, pointless nonsense. But guess what? Because of that mocked activism, whales have been saved. Including it now develops a population of the uh, largest animal that has ever existed on Earth, blue whales. According to a new survey, the population of California blue whales was once near extinction as a result of whaling, has made a remarkable comeback. It now stands up at a population of about 2,200, which is about 97% of its historical 19th century levels. Now, this is the only population of blue whales known to have recovered that much from the depredations of whaling. A few populations of blue whales, in fact, have gone extinct. But it, does, it still does show, uh, and this is quoting Cole Monahan, who's a doctoral student at the University of Washington. He led the study that discovered this. His words it, that it shows, quote, the ability of blue whale populations to rebuild under careful management and conservation measures. Now, blue whales can grow to be about 100 feet long and weigh over 190 tons. That is twice as much as the largest known dinosaurs. They are, again, the largest creature ever to exist on this planet. Now, the comeback in the population, in fact, the blue whales, would be even more dramatic were it not for the fact that at least 11 whales are struck and sometimes killed uh, in collisions with uh, ships off the west coast of the U.S. That's like every year, and that's nearly four times the level desired under the uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act, which, by the way, is a law that only exists because of that activism which the bozos with the right tried to ridicule. Now, these deaths, uh, yearly deaths, aren't enough to actually reduce the population of the whales, but they do hinder the increase in the population. That said, this is still a remarkable success story for conservation efforts, uh, and that quite bluntly, it's a, it's a record that exists only because a bunch of silly lefties thought it was, didn't make a lot of sense to, again, kill off the largest animal that has ever existed on Earth. Uh, another bit of good news, uh, we could just file this under, and the beat goes on. On Thursday, September 4th, a three-judge panel of the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals upheld a lower court decision that declared bans on same-sex marriages in the states of Indiana and Wisconsin are unconstitutional. The decision came down just a week after the court heard oral arguments, which is remarkably fast and could be taken as an indication of how clear and simple the justices thought the legal uh, issues involved are. Writing for the court, court, Judge Richard Posner called the state's arguments against same-sex marriage, quote, totally implausible. Uh, and he said that the argument that same-sex couples should not be allowed to marry because they can't conceive children, quoting him again, is so full of holes it cannot be taken seriously. And later in his ruling, he sarcastically made the observation, and again I'm quoting him, Heterosexuals get drunk and pregnant, producing unwanted children. Their reward is to be allowed to marry. Homosexual couples do not produce unwanted children. Their reward is to be denied the right to marry. Go figure. 
Uh, then after this, just four days after this happened, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals held oral arguments on same-sex marriage bans in Idaho, Nevada, and Hawaii. And the members of the three-judge panel there made no secret of their disdain for the arguments for bigotry. Now, in attempting to defend the bans in Idaho and Nevada, a guy named Monty Stewart, he's of the Coalition for the Protection of Marriage, he argued that male-female marriages uh, presents a message that according to, this is the way one news report uh, described him, uh, he said that it presents a message that strengthens a child's bonding right with his or her biological parents. And widening that institution to include same-sex couples, he continued, weakens the social expectation of the child's bonding right and sends the social, social message that fathers are not a valuable part of child rearing. That didn't go over well. Uh, Judge Marsha Burzen responded that he, that is um, the lawyer, was sending a message that families headed by same-sex couples were second-rate. Judge Ronald M. Gould questioned the very term bonding right. Is he asking, where does this term bonding right come from? Stewart essentially made it up. Uh, and, and it's, you know, and something I've noticed uh, that the judges apparently did not address, Stewart's reference to this bonding right was with his or her biological parents. But if that's so important, shouldn't Idaho and Nevada be banning adoption? Shouldn't, it be, shouldn't giving up a child for adoption, the very thing that a lot of these same people argue is an alternative to abortion, shouldn't giving up a child for adoption be illegal on the grounds that it denies the child its bonding rights with its biological parents? And so well, the, well, the, the court did not notice that particular thing, but Judge Stephen Reinhardt did ask why in the, in the case of this bonding right, Idaho does not ban divorce. Stewart's only answer was the thoroughly lame, well, they may. Reinhardt, uh, he's actually the guy who wrote the 2012 decision which overturned California's infamous Proposition 8. He also observed that people who are attracted to their own gender, quote, also have the right to live their lives as human beings, which is pretty much all the advocates for marriage justice are asking for. Seventh Circuit was the third federal circuit court to strike down bans on same-sex marriage as unconstitutional. By all appearances, the Ninth Circuit will make four. Overall, more than 60 state and federal courts have ruled in favor of marriage equality since the Supreme Court struck down a central part of the Defense of Marriage Act last year. Uh, as of now, same-sex marriage is legal in 19 states and Washington, D.C. The Supreme Court, by the way, is expected to weigh in on this in its next term, which starts in October and runs through next June. Uh, unfortunately, on this very same topic, we also have some not good news. The unbroken string of more than 20 straight victories in federal court on marriage justice has come to an end. Now, we knew it would come eventually. We never expected that we could win every single case. Uh, but it's still a disappointment when it did happen, even though it's not really a surprise. It came in the case of Louisiana, where dist U.S. District Court Judge Martin Feldman declared that no fundamental right was at stake, and so the state needed only to show a legitimate reason for banning same-sex couples from marrying, which he declared the state did, uh, that legitimate reason being, quoting him, linking children to an intact family formed by their two biological parents by which logic, as I just noted a minute or two ago, divorce and adoption should both also be banned. His only other argument, the only other argument Feldman offered was the classic slippery slope one that allowing for same-sex marriage would of necessity uh, mean allowing for parents to marry their children and brothers to marry each other and so on and so on. As Richard Posner said, um, such an argument cannot be taken seriously. It really is a rather bizarre ruling, uh, and I think that any actual opponents of marriage justice, um, they're going to look at this and they're probably not going to want this to be the case that their argument is going to rest on. Um, consider that in dealing, in, in, in his decision, after dealing with the legal technicalities, that's the background of the case and the requirements for issuing a summary judgment, Feldman starts his actual argument by referring to being gay or lesbian as a lifestyle choice, placing him firmly among the scientific ignoramuses who still insist that people choose to be homosexual. 
do me a favor, if you ever meet any of those people, ask them when it was and why it was that they chose to be straight. Now, he claimed that the fundamental right at issue was not marriage, but same-sex marriage. The idea of which he went on was too new to be a fundamental right. Uh, you know, well, in fact, of, of course, the, the, the fundamental right at issue is not same-sex marriage. The fundamental right at issue is marriage. You know, if this was a voting case, uh, I cannot imagine that he'd be talking about uh, a, the, a fundamental right of of a black vote as opposed to the right to vote. The right to marriage is the fundamental issue at hand. And in fact, the legal battle in, U in the U.S. over same-sex marriage has been going on for 42 years now. And in fact, male bonding ceremonies, uh, which, which in essence were marriage in all but name, they date to the 12th century or earlier. Now, What's more, his finding that Louisiana need only show a legitimate reason for its bigotry was based on his confusing, uh, confusing strict scrutiny and the somewhat lowered level of heightened scru uh, scrutiny. These are measures of how, how much justification a state has to have a law uh, in order to overcome a challenge to it, how closely that law has to be examined. And what's more, he completely and blatantly misstated what the Constitution says. In trying to dismiss a, um, a comparison to Loving v. Virginia, this is the famous case where the Supreme Court struck down laws on uh, get banning interracial marriage, uh, Feldman claims that that was done because the 14th Amendment, quote, expressly condemns racial discrimination as a constitutional evil. But it doesn't. It never mentions race. It says all persons have the protections of due process and that no person can be denied the equal treatment of the laws. Now, I've mentioned several times that it seems to me in, in every one of the pro-justice decisions that have come down, there was some line, some bit of phrasing that was notable for its insight or its elegance or both. Somehow then it seems fitting that the decision upholding what is the old, the outdated, the fearful, the bigotry, that that decision should lack any trace of either. All right, going on from there, now it is time for one of our regular weekly features. It's the outrage of the week. The United States Air Force has apparently decided that the Constitution does not apply to it. The case is that of an unnamed technical sergeant at Creech Air Force Base in Nevada. His service time is coming to an end in November, and last month he tried to re-enlist. But he was refused. The Air Force wouldn't take him. They told him, no, you've got to go. Why? I mean, was he a troublemaker? Did he have a bad reputation? Was he insubordinate? Did he have just a lousy record? Was he a security risk? What? No, none of the above. It turns out he's an atheist. And since he enlisted, the Air Force has changed its rules about the oath that you have to take to join or rejoin the Air Force. That oath ends with the phrase, so help me God. Now, formerly, uh, a person could opt out of saying that phrase or substitute a different phrase for it. But in October 2013, last October, the Air Force changed its rules and said, no, 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 you have to say it, no option, no choice. You have to declare a belief in God in order to be a member of the Air Force. I will note that the USAF is the only branch of the U.S. military with this requirement. The Air Force doesn't budge. The sergeant is prepared to sue them in federal court. Uh, the American Humanist Association has taken up his case and will represent him. And I think it's hard to see how this action by the Air Force could not be unconstitutional, not only based on the First Amendment, but also on the fact that Article 6 of the Constitution says, quoting, no religious test shall be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. Now, actually, what appears to the rest of that clause that what was being thought about was elected or appointed offices, um, you also have to remember that at the time the Constitution was framed, there was no expectation of having a standing army, and it's doubtful they would even imagine an air force. Given that, and given that we now have a standing army and a standing air force, it surely seems that being a member of the air force should be considered a public trust under the meaning of Article 6. I know all this may seem to you like a very minor thing to be the outrage of the week. I mean, after all, who cares about atheists? There are so few of them. 
But don't forget, first, that this involves a basic constitutional right. And it's not only atheists who would be affected. It can impact, for example, agnostics, depending on how strongly they feel about talking about believing in God. Uh, and plus more, there are religions that are not monotheistic, that, that do not believe in a single entity of God, and there are others that don't hold the belief in a God at all, at least a God in the classic Judeo-Christian sense. But all that, that's, all that's true, but it's also still completely irrelevant, because the issue here remains the same. Basic rights. The basic, the fundamental right to be able to fully participate in society. And stripping away that right from a group does not become unimportant just because a majority, even a large majority of the population, figures they won't be affected by it. It's also important for another reason. This is not the first time the Air Force has been found evangelizing. Several years ago, the U.S. Air Force Academy faced accusations that evangelical Christians exerted a dominating influence over the institution. And when the Air Force responded with what seemed like an honest attempt to emphasize respect for all belief systems, in fact, they even set up a pagan religion, nature religion worship area at the, at the Air Force Academy, uh, the Air Force was assailed by the right-wing Christians and their, and their allies in Congress on the wacko claim that efforts to avoid religious favoritism were actually an attack on freedom of religion. Freedom of religion being defined here by them as essentially evangelical Christian being able to say and do whatever they want, including officers telling their subordinates what religious practices they're supposed to follow. It was after this, not immediately after, about a year after, but still after this, that the Air Force started requiring enlistees to declare that they believe in God. And then a month later, this is now last November, November 2013, the Air Force Academy, the same academy that was found earlier to be overrun with evangelicals abusing their authority, the Air Force Academy hired a longtime advocate and practitioner of the thoroughly bogus and often harmful gay conversion therapy to oversee its counseling program for the cadets. So while you may think it's unimportant that an atheist is barred from joining the Air Force, even though it's not, um, I doubt you'll think it's unimportant that it appears that the most conservative forms of right-wing Christianity are still finding a warm and welcoming embrace and holding positions of influence and authority at the Air Force Academy. That, I suspect you will agree, is an outrage. And we are taking a break. And we're back. Uh, we're going to lighten things up here just for a minute with uh, an episode of our occasional feature, Unintentional Humor. This is where something that's not supposed to be funny just is. And this week we have a knee slapper. Came for the TV on September 3rd in an attempt to trash Jon Stewart of The Daily Show, Bill O'Reilly ringingly declared to his audience, quoting him, when you hear something on a partisan-driven program, do not believe it. You heard the man. All right, here's an update for you. And last week, I talked some about the, uh, the upcoming one-day strike by fast food workers. Uh, I said it was a little odd to be talking about it because when I was saying it, the strike hadn't happened. But by the time you saw the show, it had. Um, but in any event, I told you about it. Now it's a week later. The strikes happened. And frankly, I think it was terrific. Protests and strikes occurred in over 100 cities, including thousands of workers at places like McDonald's, Taco Bell, Wendy's, KFC, and other places. There was nonviolent civil disobedience, generally like sit ins in order to block traffic. Uh, there was nonviolent civil disobedience at a number of these sites. A representative of Fight for 15, this is the group organizing the protest, said nearly 500 people had been arrested or cited that day. Um, cited means they received a citation, that is, it's almost like a traffic ticket instead of being arrested. But this was a countrywide protest. People arrested 47 people in Kansas City, 27 in West Milwaukee, 19 in New York, 30 in Detroit, 11 in San Diego, 8 in Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania, 7 in Miami, 3 in Denver. 19 citations are issued in Chicago, 13 in Hartford, 10 in Indianapolis, 10 in Las Vegas. Now, I will note, I will acknowledge uh, that there are people who say that the goal of uh, a $15 an hour living wage is a bad idea. Uh, 
Uh, their argument is that such a wage will encourage more highly educated people to compete for those jobs, leaving the less educated even further behind than they already are. Now this argument, I'll note, is based on nothing but their own assumptions. Assumptions which of necessity include the idea that raising the wages of these low-income workers, in effect establishing a base prevailing wage for the area, will not also tend to raise the wages of everybody else at more skilled, more educated jobs. Which if it did happen, which is what you'd expect, would actually undermine the sudden, supposed sudden desire of college graduates to go flip burgers. Now, so the reason I mention, mention that at all is that even some of those people will say that the strikes, uh, the fast food worker strikes, have been a stunning success. Saying that, and again, I'm quoting that same person, for the cost of a few Super Bowl ads, the SEIU, which is the union backing the protest, the SEIU and some dedicated fast food workers have managed to completely rewire how the public and politicians thinks about wages. Now, as I noted last week, these strikes have been central to the effort to keep the twin issues of the minimum wage and wage inequality uh, in the public debate, even as corporate America, the rich, and many in government, to the extent that those categories don't overlap, um, would rather have us not thinking about them at all. And the fact is, there's a lot to think about. According to a survey by the Federal Reserve released last week, the gap between the richest Americans and the rest of the nation widened after the Great Recession, worsening the already bad U.S. income inequality. From 2010 to 2013, the average income for U.S. families rose about 4% after accounting for inflation. All of that income growth was concentrated among the top 3% of earners, the other 97% got nowhere. That top 3% of earners sucked up 30.5% of all income. If you look at wealth rather than income, it's even worse. In 1989, the richest 3% held 44.8% of the net worth in the country. By 2007, that was up to nearly 52%. By 2013, it was 54.5%. And according to a new study out of the Harvard Business School, which was released September 8th, that widening gap is unsustainable and will ultimately be damaging not only to the, corpor uh, to the economy as a whole, but even to the corporations that depend upon that inequality for their profit. But even so, even despite that, that same study concluded, the situation is unlikely to improve anytime soon and workers will continue to struggle to make ends meet while corporations continue to reap the benefits of that inequality. And although the study doesn't say this, one reason it's unlikely to get any better, uh, better unless we start seeing people in the streets, uh, one reason it's unlikely to get any better was found in the response of Fed Chair, Chair of the Federal Reserve, Janet Yellen. Now, did, Janet Yellen was one of those nominees that we were all required to love because Barack Obama proposed her. Janet Yellen responded to evidence of growing income inequality by seeing it was a disturbing trend, but she attributed some of it to the weak jobs market, but also to underlying trends like technology and globalization. Now, note the passive voice here. In other words, income inequality, she's saying, is not the result of conscious decisions by corporate leaders to maximize their profits by squeezing their workers. Uh, it's not the result of a decades-long right-wing campaign to contain, undermine, and ultimately destroy unions. It's not the result of any refusals or failures by Congress or the White House or the Fed to address it. Oh, no, it's not the result of anything anyone actually did. It's all about disembodied uh, trends such as technology and globalization, forces of economic nature that are not subject, or driven, subject to or driven by actual human intervention. It's just out of our control. That's what you get when you forget that when it comes to the interest of corporate America and our economic elite, people like Janet Yellen are not on your side. Barack Obama is not on your side. These people are on your side. And don't you ever forget it. All right, last but not least, it's our other regular weekly feature, the Clown Award, given as always for meritorious stupidity. This week, the winner of the Big Red Nose is Republican House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy, and few people have deserved it more. 
Okay, start with the fact that the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, has a website, GASP, which includes a blog, again GASP. On August 29th, uh, Catherine Sosby of the U.S. Forest Service posted on that blog. Her post was titled, How Does Your Marshmallow Roast? and was in honor of National Roasted Marshmallow Day. And yes, there actually is such a thing. It was August 30th. Anyway, in the post, Sosby talks about s'mores, which, as she says, are, for a lot of people, the best possible thing you can do with the humble marshmallow. She goes over how to make s'mores and what the history of s'mores is. She then gives some safety tips for roasting marshmallows, especially if uh, children are the ones doing it. Safety tips which, oddly enough, the children in the picture accompanying the post are not following. But next she suggests some variations on s'mores, such as substitute, substituting grilled pineapple slices for the chocolate, before closing out with some other ways to use marshmallows as campfire treats. Okay, so in other words, this is like one of those silly filler things that you find in the free newspapers that you pick up somewhere, right? Nothing of any importance, right? Not to Kevin McCarthy. He knows the real agenda here, and it's horrifying, I tell you, it's horrifying. He told other house coppers about it in a memo last week. He said, and I'm quoting, this perfectly captures what's wrong with our government. He rages on hard-earned tax dollars supporting bureaucrats who can't pass up an opportunity to tell us how to live our lives. Yes, because a blog post including alternatives to traditional s'mores is undermining American initiative. It's telling us how to live our lives. It's government taking over every aspect of our lives, according to Kevin McCarthy, who offered no calculation of how many hard-earned tax dollars he spent getting this vital missive out. Kevin McCarthy, the man who knows what's really wrong with our government, dictating how we roast our marshmallows. Kevin McCarthy, clown. All right, that's it for this week. Uh, we're going to wrap up there. So I'm just going to tell you very briefly, um, and as always, we invite any comments you may have, any ideas you may have. Um, if you have some... It, if you have something you want to argue with me about, go ahead and email me. If you have something that you want to hear me go on about, email me. Let me know. Uh, but for the moment, we're just going to stop this right here um, because I'm just going to say, why don't you just go ahead and you have the best week you possibly can. We will see you next week. For now, peace.